Thank you. Thank you, Tom, uh, for hosting this, introducing me, and uh, for all that, uh, that uh, Pete Marwick, uh, excuse me, that, uh, that uh, Hold on a second. God, God I'm a, he's never going to let me speak here again. The Price Waterhouse does for, <laughs> the Price Waterhouse does for the Farm Policy Association. I wanted to uh, be able to thank Noel Latif, personally, who does such a great job of running the Foreign Policy Association, but I understand he came down with a stomach virus, I'm told, and he didn't want to communicate that <laughs> to any of us here. So, uh, but I thank him for giving me this opportunity uh, to, uh, to do so. Uh, I guess what I would just talk about briefly, about 20 minutes or so, this is what I've told, 20, 25 minutes, and then questions is always a fun time, I think, for me. But what I want to talk about a little bit is the uh, lessons learned in the debt crisis of the 1980s and 90s in Latin America, Asia in the 1990s, Turkey in 2001, and Uruguay in 2003, where I led the restructurings and worked with governments there. Uh, I think that what we're seeing now, yeah, can, you can't, maybe we ought to put this on, maybe I ought to do this, instead of using this, maybe we ought to use this. Yeah, okay, well then. Okay, can you hear now? Thank you. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> what I was just saying is that based on my experience in debt restructurings in various areas, Latin America, Asia, Turkey, uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, right up to uh, this decade uh, that we're going into, there are a number of lessons that uh, have been learned. And I was asked to write this book by a number of policymakers, uh, fellow bankers, and people very much from the countries themselves to put down on record to help ameliorate whatever the next crisis is going to be because we're always going to have one crisis or another. The question is, do we learn the lessons from one so the next one isn't as bad? And uh, so that's what I, I want to do. What we see today, specifically in the Eurozone, is where I think these lessons learned uh, have not been learned uh, in the sense that they have not really taken into account the lessons from these other crises. And you're going to ask me, why is that? And uh, the answer is because the Europeans will tell you because, uh, you know, they're mature economies. So what do they have to learn from the emerging markets? Well, as it turns out, they have an awful lot to learn. And uh, we're two years into this crisis, which started with Greece. And uh, also, if you take a look at our own situation, we have the reserve currency of the world, the United States. And I want to talk about the U.S., but I'll be happy to give you my thoughts on our economy uh, in the question and answer period. We have a tremendous deficit problem here in the United States, and uh, having the reserve currency of the world is not going to cover it up for us. Uh, and these things always come home to roost. And I think in the case of Europe, we're seeing a crisis that started with a very small economy, Greece, uh, and is now expanded till it's affecting the economies and the markets worldwide, as you see daily with the volatility in the marketplaces here in the United States and worldwide. And also you see uh, in the uh, growth or lack of growth we see in this economy and other economies worldwide. First uh, lesson learned is that every uh, country is different. There's no cookie cutter approach. And this is very important because you, you can't just say there's a plan for one country and it'll work everywhere. You have to adjust uh, any sort of a plan you have. Case in point, Greece got into trouble because of the sovereign. They built up a tremendous deficit that was hidden on the books. And uh, this is why uh, I think uh, when you take a look at a sovereign, it is very important to understand what kind of management they have. That then infected the banks. In the case of Ireland, it was completely different. The Irish had a very good fiscal situation. Uh, the government itself was very careful on building up deficits. What happened was their regulation of the banks was not good, and the banking system basically put the whole country into tank, in the tank when uh, the government guaranteed the banks. In the case of Portugal, which was next on the list, uh, Portugal has had real, really no growth for 10 years, and the banks were dragged into that. 
by being pushed to buy government bonds by the accounting regulations that the EU had on, uh, on banks. Because what did they do? They basically told banks, if you hold sovereign bonds, you don't have to put any capital against it. And so that has come home really to hit uh, these countries and the institutions, the banking and other financial institutions there, but particularly in the banks. In the case of Spain, uh, what we had there was uh, the Cajas, similar to our savings and loans, uh, way expanded in their housing bubble, similar to our housing bubble and similar to the Irish housing bubble, and were not properly regulated there. <clears throat> and uh, many of them failed, have to be taken over by government, and are being combined as we talk right now. In addition to that, the Zapatero socialist government waited a long time to implement necessary budget and austerity measures. Uh, in Spain, you have an election coming up on the 20th of November, which will decide whether the socialists stay in power or the conservatives of Partido Popular comes back in. It'll probably be the Partido Popular based on <laughs> polls, but at least you have a date certain, unlike the situation in Italy, where you, uh, we don't know when elections are gonna take place. We, we don't know when elections are gonna take place either in Greece, although you have a new government that's just been announced. And so that at least is a date certain. In the case of Italy, <clears throat> we have a country, and Spain, by the way, is the fourth largest economy in the Eurozone, <coughs> Italy the third largest economy. And there you have a situation where uh, Italy has 120% of, uh, de uh, of uh, deficit to GDP, which is very, very high. A book written a few years ago by Rokoff uh, <coughs> and Reinhardt basically states, based on the history of debt crisis throughout the centuries, if you have over 90%, it's very difficult to really bring a country back anytime soon. And here, in the case of Greece, it's 150% of GDP, the deficit. And in the case of uh, uh, <coughs> their debt uh, to, uh, to GDP, uh, the debt to GDP is 150% more or less in Greece. It's 120% in, uh, uh, in Italy. Also, Italy has had problems with their political situation because Berlusconi was not getting, who's the prime minister, uh, still prime minister, until a new government is formed, unless that's happened while we were standing around here, uh, <coughs> is, uh, had a real problem with his own cabinet and his own party. He had real arguments uh, and, and had a difficult time getting along with Tremonti, his finance minister. And this made it very difficult to put through the proper uh, uh, deficit uh, reducing austerity measures and uh, really get a budget through. They would just manage to get through the, uh, the 2010 budget, much less the 2011 budget over the last week. It just shows you what the situation was there. The banking system actually in, uh, in Italy is still in pretty good shape. But all of these things have created these difficulties and the markets respond uh, when they see that action isn't being taken. And the worst thing that you can do is for a politician or a policymaker is to give a date uh, when something's gonna be done and not do it, or make an announcement that something will be done, don't give a date, and don't do it anyway. So I think this is what we've been seeing in Europe. And so I gave you some of the examples of how each one of these countries got into trouble for different reasons. There is, however, one common denominator here and that common denominator is contagion. And so uh, that is something that uh, the European policymakers thought was, was a, a word that was only utilized uh, for emerging market countries. And that as mature, so-called mature economies, members of the Eurozone, the European Union, it didn't apply to them. And when I tried to use that term, uh, others did also with uh, Prime Minister Papandreou, uh, in early part of 2010, I saw him in the World Economic Forum in Davos in January of 2010, and uh, we were talking about that, and I talked to the head of the European Central Bank and a number of other senior policymakers from Europe. They basically said, look, this is an isolated problem of Greece. There's no way you're gonna have contagion like we had in Latin America and like we had in Asia in the 1980s and 90s. So uh, this is something not for, not for Europe, not for mature economies. Unfortunately, all you hear and see about in the print and media today is contagion because that's what we've had.
Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and now very much Italy. And so this is another one, and it can all, it's, it's, it, it's basically both economic and political. In a number of the countries I've mentioned to you, it's not just economic, it's also political. Because where you have econ economic contagion, it spreads to politics, and you have political contagion. And I think that, again, this was something that we faced all throughout Latin America in the 1980s and the early 90s and in Asia, in the Asian financial crisis in 1997 and 98. And I mentioned also Turkey, Uruguay at the turn of the century. And so another point that is key here is timing. Paul Volcker taught me when I went down to see him in uh, fall of 19. 82 at the beginning of the Latin American debt crisis. And you remember Paul was then chairman of the Federal Reserve System and was kind enough to give me an introduction to the book. And the first lesson that Paul taught me was he said, you know, Rhodes, you don't have all the time in the world to get some of these things done. This was in the midst of the beginning of the Mexican debt crisis, which everyone thought could have turned into the Great Depression. And they were talking about at the IMF World Bank meetings in Canada, in Toronto, on uh, uh, on rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And he said, timing is key. You've got to get out there and you've got to reassure uh, the market that, uh, that the countries can, uh, in one way or another, restructure their debt and get back to service their debt. And so he said, never forget timing. And again, as you've seen over and over again in Europe, there's a feeling that there's all the time in the world, whether it be the announcements just taking this year, July 21st, uh, the whole crisis was supposed to be resolved in Europe. The heads of state got together, they had a meeting, they made announcements of what was going to be done, and that was supposed to be it. Problem is no timetable was mentioned, and uh, a lot of, uh, in fact, most of what they said was going to be done was not done. Now we have again a meeting October 26th, 27th uh, in Europe, same thing was said, uh, <clears throat> and they didn't talk much about the 21st of, of July. So the feeling was that they had all the time in the world to resolve these problems. And the truth of it is, you don't have all the time in the world to resolve them, particularly when markets almost move in nanoseconds today. When we did Latin America in the early 80s, the markets didn't move that rapidly, or even in Asia in the late 1990s, but today they move extremely rapidly. And I would say that <clears throat> We're seeing that really, uh, I think, in a very strong manner in what's occurred in Italy. Because the perception was this summer among the leaders of Europe that Italy was not going to be a problem. Uh, that uh, Italy was going to be a very competitive economy and they would work their way out. But as you see what's happened and you see where the markets uh, <coughs> have gone. And so timing, I think, is, uh, is critical. Also, I think it's very important, and this is be a fourth point, that when <clears throat> a government announce uh, its reform, austerity measures, that they be able to say that, that these measures are, uh, are really self-grown, that the government itself in the country has been willing to put together a package, a plan, and implement it uh, with the support of major international financial institutions, uh, or in the case of Europe, the Troika, which is the European Union, uh, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, but if, if you give the impression or let the populace of a country believe that the program is imposed on the country and imposed on the government, then you're not going to get them to support it. And we've seen this in Greece. Uh, which is why, in desperation, at the end of almost two years, Papandreou decided to call a referendum and then pulled it off the table because he was very much aware that his own people didn't support his programs. And I've never seen a case in all of the experience I've had uh, in both Latin America, Asia, and elsewhere, where at the end of the day, if the population isn't convinced or the majority of the population isn't convinced that the program is going to lead to growth and is something that their government uh, really had a hand in putting together, they're not going to support it. And that's what happened uh, very much in the case of Greece. 
Uh, now you have a new government in Greece, uh, headed a technocratic government, Lucas Papadimus, who, who I know, who was former vice president of the European Central Bank, who is a very much respected individual, and uh, I think may have a shot at implementing this program, which they haven't been implemented to date, because he's respected throughout Greece by all the political parties and respected by the Troika. So we'll have to see if he can do what Papandreou and Venizelos were unable to do over the last almost uh, two years. And then, uh, you know, I, I look at this very much as kind of a, as, as in Mandarin Chinese, Wei Ji, as a crisis opportunity because a lot of these things come around and it's, it's an opportunity to really, uh, for a government to implement proper programs that maybe they couldn't have implemented before uh, when they weren't in the depth of a crisis. But so far, we have not really seen much of that. The closest we've seen to that, I think, of the countries I've mentioned is Ireland. And at this point in time, if you ask me which country was going to come out first of this, I would say probably Ireland. And, you don't, and, and the reason you don't hear much about Ireland is they're, they're trying to implement their own program there, uh, backed by the Troika, but it's basically an Irish program. I think that as an example of countries that did this, and heads of state, because leadership is key here. And that's what we haven't seen in Europe. It's, it's true in our own country, any country. If you don't have firm political leadership, you can't get tough economic uh, programs through, particularly ones uh, where you're talking about austerity. And I give you three examples uh, of those where I think the leaders of Europe should look. First of all, I would say Brazil, under Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who was then finance minister. Brazil had gone into a moratorium in the late 1980s, and uh, they were being shut off uh, on their credit lines worldwide, and the country was, was going through a very difficult period economically and politically. He was named uh, as, as a finance minister, and he put through, the first thing he did is uh, to put through a, a debt uh, restructuring. Uh, we did a version of the Brady Plan, which I'll mention afterwards, uh, which <coughs> allowed the country to settle a debt problem which had been open for, for a number of years. Immediately thereafter, he and his own team, Brazilian team, okay, not imposed by the IMF or anybody else, put together <coughs> what's known now as the Real Plan to, to basically stabilize the economy, get the country out of hyperinflation, uh, and start servicing his debt and getting growth. Because what's key in all these programs is you can convince a population that you can get a plan on the table that will lead to sustainable growth. Because no population is going to put up with austerity forever, i.e. Greece is in its, uh, uh, the end of its four, third year of, of uh, negative growth. And the austerity program has pushed it even further. It'll 6% uh, negative growth probably this year. And next year it looks like negative growth also. So I think uh, what Fernando Enrique did, and by the way, that got him elected president for two terms. I think it's fair to say that Lula da Silva more or less continued that program, and Dilma Rousseff is continuing it today. And this was done in the early 1990s. So when you do the right things, and uh, you can be able to sell it to your population, uh, then you can take one of the, the most difficult situation in the world and turn it into an opportunity. Another one I would mention is uh, Korea. 1997-98. Korea was one of the countries most hit by the Asian financial crisis. You had Korean women uh, going around block on block in front of the Central Bank of Korea, melting down their gold jewelry because they didn't want Korea to go into default. Uh, Koreans have tremendous patriotism, uh, but that alone was not going to get them out of the problem. And they had just elected a new president, Kim Dae-jong. Uh, Kim Dae-jong was the first <coughs> really leftist president of the country since their uh, World War II when they uh, got their independence again from the Japanese. And so everyone was greatly concerned that he wouldn't take the necessary steps to turn the economy around, which had gotten, as I said, the brunt of the Asian financial crisis. And so I was given the job of restructuring the short-term debt. Some of you in the room know this. First thing I did was get on an airplane to go meet him when he was president-elect. And I said, I need your support, Mr. President. Uh, you're going to be president in two weeks, and if I don't have your support, I'm not going to get the banks. I had stopped the banks from pulling worldwide. The reserves were less than a billion dollars today. They were $330 billion. 
Uh, and so he said, he said, Rhodes, uh, he said, if you will do this, restructure that debt, you're helping in Korea, and my job is to take Korea out of this mess. I think the program of the IMF may be too rigorous, but I know it's necessary to get my country out, and I will see that it's implemented, and I will see you have our full backing. And he did it. So even though he had qualms, he showed the leadership to get Korea out. Now, Korea's had a problem here and there, but the Korean economy is, is one of the fastest growing, not only in Asia, but in the world, because he took the necessary leadership. The last example, because I want to use a different part of the world, is Turkey. Turkey had gone through a number of financial and economic crises in, <clears throat> in the 1990s. And uh, uh, the Esafet government came into power, and there was another run on the banks. And uh, <clears throat> the International Monetary Fund wanted to help. We had a new government in, uh, uh, the Bush administration, the second Bush administration. And they had real doubts on bailing out countries because of the experience of Argentina. And so I was asked by the uh, IMF and the Turks to convince our own treasury to let the IMF uh, support the plan. But Kemal Dervis, who had been a, uh, a, uh, a vice president of the World Bank, had a plan. It was a Turkish plan. All he needed was given some time to implement it, and as of it backed him. And we were able to convince the US and the other authorities to give him time to implement it. He was able to go to the Turkish people and say, you've got to accept these austerity measures because they will lead <coughs> to growth. And it's our plan. It's not being imposed on us by the Europeans, the US, or the International Monetary Fund. They will back it, but it's our program. And uh, we designed it. And it worked, and look where Turkey is. Uh, we always get uh, at, at the meetings, as Tom knows, uh, here at Price Waterhouse, uh, <laughs> either the deputy prime minister or the prime minister to speak about where the economy of Turkey is going. So leadership is key, and the ability to say that you have the ability to carry it out and it's homegrown. And so I think that this is what's going to have to happen in Greece, because just the Troika and everybody else imposing something on the Greek people, they need to see firm leadership of their <coughs> own and that they can carry it out. And we're going to need to see that in the case of Italy. But all of these programs have to lead to growth, because if you don't have growth, you can't do it. So this whole question of strong, political, courageous leadership is tied in uh, together with, with, with all of these. And finally, as one of the final points here, the, <clears throat> the private sector. You remember the, probably a number of you remember in the 1980s and 90s when we had all these programs with Latin America and, e and Asia, uh, there was this old uh, song about bailing out the banks who were then the chief holders of the debt. Well, no one's saying that much now, but in the sense of the European Central Bank is in there buying bonds of all these countries, and where are the bonds coming from? The private sector. And the reason so, because the private sector was not called in at the beginning of this crisis to sit down at the table as they were in so many of the emerging markets and saying, okay, we have to work out a plan together, and if necessary, there may have to be a hit. But if you do it now, it'll be better to do it now than to do it later. And so in the case of Greece, they never even bothered to call the private sector in until this summer. And then they went through all of these various discussions which ended up nowhere, and we're now at, at an agreement in principle. But there's, there's really no timetable or, or really even uh, details how it's going to work out of a 50% haircut on the, uh, on the private sector side of the holders of Greek debt. And so if the private sector had been called in along with all of these other things, the problems in Greece would be something we wouldn't even be discussing here because they wouldn't have gone on to these other countries. And <clears throat> obviously, I've mentioned uh, five countries, but this is having its impact on France, even on Germany. So all members of the Eurozone, and, and the, although the, U, uh, the UK is not a member of the Eurozone, it's a member of the EU, and it's impacting them and the other members in East and Central Europe. Uh, not to speak of what it's doing to our economy, Bernanke just said it today, again, the Chinese, President Hu Jintao mentioned it at the group of uh, 20 meetings, India and China just signed a, pr a press release yesterday criticizing Europe <coughs> and the so-called mature economies for impacting their economies. So, the markets today are so interlinked that you can't segregate emerging from mature markets. And so I think that uh, getting the private sector involved is really, really key. Another thing that I think, and I will take a, 
a kudo for our own regulators here who have been beaten up very badly for, the, for what happened in 2007, 8, and 9 here in the United States. But what they decided to do two years ago is to have a series of stress tests on the banks. And they were tough stress tests. And all the banks involved had to substantially increase capital. And it worked. In the case of Europe, they're now into their third stress test. The first one <coughs> cleared the Irish banks within months. The Irish banks were in the tank and had to be intervened by the government. A good number of the savings and loans were, uh, that were all passed uh, in Spain were also in the tank and had to be intervened by the government or merged. And a number of the regional banks, the Landes banks, had to be helped out by the states in Germany where they were located. And so then they just said, OK, we screwed up the first time around. We're going to have a second set of stress tests. That was in 2009. And after giving various dates for it, the results finally came out in July, beginning of July this year. <coughs> and you know the bank, one of the banks that was the top on that list of passing grades is a bank called Dexia. You, I think those of you who follow the markets know what happened to Dexia. And uh, they had to be intervened, part of it nationalized, et cetera. And you know why? They were heavy, hold among other things, they were, uh, they were heavy holders of sovereign debt. And uh, the regulators in Europe said, you don't have to maintain capital against sovereign debt because sovereigns don't default. It was like my, my mentor, Walter Riston, used to say, and I used to kid him about it, when he wrote an op-ed at the time of, of the Mexican crisis that, you know, countries don't go bankrupt because they eventually work it out and they have assets. And so I said, that's right, uh, <coughs> Walt, just the banks and institutions that lend to them. <laughs> and this was kind of very similar. So now uh, what we have is we have a new set of stress tests that were announced, that were announced in the uh, communique of the Eurozone, October 26th and 27th. And what they're saying is they have to move forward their capital requirements uh, to uh, uh, minimum June this year uh, to get to the 9% uh, Basel III capital requirements. And as part of that, they had to write down uh, a lot of the sovereign bond debt of countries in trouble. So what's happening with this? Uh, you're seeing a lot of shedding of assets <coughs> by the European <coughs> banks. Uh, they're also announcing cuts in, in uh, bonuses, eliminating bonuses, cutting some dividends. And at the same time, they may have to, in addition to have to try to raise capital, may have to go to their own governments for help. And or the stability fund uh, that's, that was approved a short while ago. And uh, as part of all of this uh, reform effort in the Eurozone. Uh, and what will that do? That's going to curtail in some way probably some banks for doing the lending they probably should uh, to various entities, you know, uh, clients in the, uh, in the Eurozone. And the Eurozone countries, not all of them, Germany isn't, but a number of them are facing stagnation or recession. So this is just going to make it even worse. So again, it's the whole idea of putting off this stuff and not taking it at the proper time. So. Just to kind of put us to where we are today, I would just say that in closing, because I think question and answer is in the best, and Tom's already giving me the eye here, is that <clears throat> if one wants to be an optimist, and as Tom said at the end, I'm, I try and be an optimist, because the only way you work your way through these situations is to believe that you can work your way through. So you've got to be an optimist. And I would say that, and that's, and that's why I'm a great believer in the expression the Mandarin Chinese expression I mentioned earlier, which is Wei Ji, crisis opportunity, is that I think that this may be an opportunity for the Europeans to finally do what they should have done a long time ago. When they put the e European Central Bank together and they formed the Eurozone, they had a treaty called a Maastricht Treaty, the city in Holland. <coughs> and they also passed what they call a Growth and Stability uh, Pact. And that said that countries that were members of the Eurozone could not have a deficit more than 3% of gross domestic, domestic product. Who were the first ones to violate it? Germany and France, the two largest members of the Eurozone. So what example did that set for other countries like the ones I mentioned? Uh, you know, Greece, Ireland, although Ireland was pretty good in that respect, Portugal, uh, Spain, et cetera. And so in the end of the day, what you had was you had a monetary union European Central Bank, which functions well, but you had no fiscal discipline, much less did you have any penalties 
uh, for those countries who didn't live up to what they had agreed to at Maastricht and the Growth and Stability Pact. In this country, we have the structure, uh, where the question is whether we have the will on the deficit side, but we have a structure. If you want a comparable <coughs> period in U.S. history, go back to the Confederation of States, the 13 states. That's basically what it looks like with the fiscal side of the Eurozone. So one of the opportunities here is to really do something on the fiscal side, either fiscal union, uh, set up a, a czar on the, on the fiscal side with the ability to put penalties on those countries that don't adhere to it in the Eurozone, including throwing them out. And this has been advocated by people like the former head of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet, and a number of others. The Dutch government has, has made a point of this. So I am hopeful out of all of this that they will get their act together. That's why I am hopeful that the Eurozone will not collapse. Because I think <clears throat> what I've learned is there are three things that eventually get you moving in these situations. One is arrogance and ignorance, <coughs> which basically get you into the situation where you think you don't have anything to learn from anybody and you know how to do it. And once you get in there, fear takes <coughs> and, you, and you mess it up like they have, then fear takes over. And fear drives you oftentimes to do what you should have done in the first place. And so I think that's <coughs> an opportunity I see. The other one is the International Monetary Fund. All during the 80s and 90s, the anchor to the financial system when countries got into trouble was the International Monetary Fund. And uh, that, because of the changeover for uh, managing directors in 10 years, uh, has really weakened uh, the cloud of the institution. Plus, today, uh, with the enormous needs of Southern Europe, the, uh, the Arab Spring, Tunisia, Egypt, will all need help, and other countries and other parts of the world. I think you need new funds for the IMF, but because of the, the voting rights, it's all tied up. But what you could have is what my friend Jacques de la Rosière did in the uh, financial crisis in, uh, <coughs> in Latin America. He got on a plane, went to Saudi Arabia, who was then the country with a big surplus and said, I need this money because otherwise we won't have enough funds and you're a stakeholder in the system and he got it. Well, today you have China, uh, you have Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries, I just got back from Kuwait. Uh, you have India, perhaps Brazil, Korea, that might be willing to put together a special trust fund if it's administered by the IMF to help their resources, to help the IMF become <coughs> an anchor again. What they don't want to do is just to pile it in to buy European bonds. The Chinese have been very, uh, very explicit on that. So this may be an opportunity for both of these things to occur. And then I think we can say that maybe this crisis produced something. I'm also optimistic, as I said, in Greece on, on Lucas Papademos. We'll have to see. And the other one is what happens in the case of, uh, of Italy is very much up in the air because we don't know what the government's going to be, who's going to be part of it, uh, and we, we certainly don't know when elections will take place. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, Tom, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.